Ready. Good luck. 1937, the Japanese are going to renew their attacks on China. This time they're going for all-out defeat. They want to get deep into the Chinese heartland to get their raw materials. This is a complete and total domination and conquering of China by Japan. Chiang Kai-shek is forced to flee into the center of China. And he's joined by thousands of urban workers and students. The people in the big cities of China, like you know, Nanking and Shanghai, they're running into the, the wilderness. And Chiang's resistance was admirable. Everyone like, man, Chiang, you're doing a really good job. But in the end, it just doesn't matter. The Communist People's Party had already set up an underground government inside of China. As Mao and his followers went village to village, hey, Chang's fighting the Japanese, but this is what we're going to do when the war is over. Listen to me and follow me. And all the pictures of Chiang Kai-shek, or excuse me, Mao Zedong, show him out amongst the people all the time. He had that connection with them, that grassroots connection. Remember, they tried it in Russia, and it didn't work. When the frat bros went out amongst the Russian people, they were like, man, get the heck out of here. Chiang Kai-shek doesn't have that um, connection with the um, people. And so here's Chiang again riding a Chiang. Here's Mao again riding um, a donkey. Here he is leading the um, Chinese people. And the Communist People's Party and Mao Zedong are also in charge of areas that the Chinese nationalists, that the KMT had controlled. While Chiang was separated from the contact with the people, Mao had that grassroots connection. And the United States was sending equipment and money for Chiang Kai-shek to fight against the Japanese. But instead of using it to fight Japan, the knucklehead hung on to it and clung to it, waiting for the war with Japan to be ended by the United States so he could once again attack the communists. And it's odd... That is, it is the Japanese invasion that does the most assistance to Mao Zedong. The Japanese provided a ripe opportunity for Mao to seize power. With Chang on the run himself, being hunted by the Japanese, Mao now can take a break. He's not being hunted. He can stay in one area and consolidate his power. His followers began to educate the Chinese peasants. They began to promote literacy in schools, in villages that didn't know what that was. He had peasants from each village form little village councils, and he taught them how to self-govern. You can't just look after yourself. You've got to look after your entire community which is like a giant family. And so, with them, Mao Great gains widespread support because he treated the Chinese people with respect. And so we get that long period between 1937 and 1945 where we got World War II going on. And in the end, in 1945, the Chinese Communist Party had gained 1.2 million members. It was larger than the Chinese Nationalist Party. It well outstrips those numbers. Mao Zedong now reigns supreme. He is in charge. And he told the people that he himself was the true heir, the successor of Sun Yat-sen. Like Tom Riddle was the true successor of Salazar Slytherin, or whatever. I think that's right. And Sun Yat-sen, even though he believed, he, excuse me, 
Mao Zedong presented himself as the true successor to Sun Yat-sen, while he himself believed in a Vladimir Lenin-like style of communism. And while Chiang Kai-shek and the KMT ruled through government-appointed officials and old aristocratic landlords, Mao worked very hard to create this grassroots bureaucracy in every little town and every little village that he came into contact with. His Communist People's Army has soldiers one million strong. And, and Mao had that charisma and leadership style that linked him with the people of China. They saw him as bringing them together, as uniting them as one of them, a man of the people, an average Joe. And Joe the plumber in a way that Chiang Kai-shek could never understand. So World War II is over, and the Japanese surrender. The United States makes the Japanese surrender to Chiang Kai-shek. Again, he was the official recognized governmental leader. Shortly thereafter, as soon as the Japanese surrender, a Chinese civil war breaks out. That thing is still going on. And in 1947, just two short years after World War II, Mao Zedong and his communist army, they go on the offensive. They're not waiting anymore. They're not defending. They're throwing knockout blows. And Mao Zedong is now known as Chairman Mao. He was the leader of the Communist Party. Many intellectuals and big businessmen, industrial owners, fled mainland China to Hong Kong and to Taiwan. It's very similar, a good synthesis parallel is like the rich people of ancient Rome. When Rome was falling, most of the rich people fled and went to Constantinople, to the Byzantine Empire, because it was close to the trade routes and all the money. While the intellectuals, the teachers, the professors, the business owners did the same thing because they saw businesses being seized, intellectuals being suppressed, as you were supposed to think the way Mao did. But overall, the people of China saw Mao Zedong as a liberator. And for the first time in hundreds of years, China was controlled and China was ruled by Chinese. And their future depended and rested upon them and their decisions. It was not going to be dictated to them by an imperial power from the West from a Japan, or from a Great Britain, or from a Germany, or from a France, or even from a United States. Last stop on our nationalism tour is Japan. And I know we've talked about this several times, so we're going to do it pretty quickly. In 1853, the isolated Japanese islands were shocked when United States Commodore Perry shows up in a steam engine. And remember, Japan had closed themselves off from the rest of the world for ages. They thought under Tokugawa Ieyasu that they had formed the most perfect civilization in the world, so they underwent that national policy of seclusion. And when the United States sailed into Tokyo Bay, with their advanced steam engine technology, Japan was forced to sign the Treaty of Friendship, where Japan was going to be opened up. And this is a new era for Japan. You can see like the British Lion and the American Eagle and the Russian Bear are just pounding China here. All right? well, we're not going to let that happen in Japan. The, Japan, the Japanese were forced to take a long look in, in the mirror. They had to really reflect on themselves. 
And they realized that their perfect society had fallen behind the rest of the world. They were not this awesome power that they thought they were. This perfectly civilized Confucian society. And they realized that the rest of the world saw them as mindless barbarians, feudal age barbarians. And after seeing Perry's steam engine and a cannon and a pistol, the Japanese realized they could no longer afford to believe in their superiority. They've got to change what they are doing. And the Japanese will undergo the most rapid industrial transformation in world history. Overnight, they will go from being a feudalistic, middle age agrarian society to a fully industrialized one in about 50 years. It's incredible. And as they had done for many, many, many years, the Japanese sent out their educated young men to figure out how to help Japan. Remember, way back when Japan was forming, they sent delegations over to China, you know, Tang Dynasty, to figure out what was going on and bring that information back. So we have Fukuzawa Yakichi, right, who is a, is a young engineer, and he's sent to study in the West. And he books a passage across the Pacific Ocean, and he's got a nice, like, stateroom. But he's always down in the engine room talking with the mechanics and the ship engineer and drawing mechanical drawings of, of this ship. And they asked him what he was doing, and he very boldly states, well, the next time I cross this ocean from Japan, I'm going to do it faster than I am in your ship. I'm going to do it in less than two weeks, which is the time it took from Japan to California at the time. And sure enough, years later, Fukuzawa makes a more efficient steam engine. Now, to be totally fair, the one he built was brand new. The one he was traveling on here was kind of old and worn out and broken in. But it doesn't matter. He did it. And it shows how the Japanese are great borrowers. They will take something, they will tinker with it, and they will figure it out and make it better, faster, of a higher quality, and cheaper. In the 1970s, a fledgling motor corporation, the Hondas, were putting the big American automobiles out of business by building a small, fuel-efficient car, the Honda Civic. You get a, like a Honda Accord today, that sucker will run forever. Good craftsmanship, good quality. Take what other people do and modify it. And Fukuzawa also brings back Western ideas about science, about government, about economics, and um, legal systems. And when he gets back to Japan, he explains to the Japanese government that the Western way of life was intertwined with their freedom. So the things that make them powerful, their industry, their technology, their, their thriftiness is intertwined with what they do. He said that freedom must exist because it's the independent spirit of Americans to better themselves. In the West, they put all of their effort into their jobs because they know the harder they work, the more productive they were, the more money they would get. There was incentive. My work output equals a greater paycheck. In some countries, when you're given a quota, you don't bust your tail. You only make the quota because you no matter how hard you work, you're never going to get paid any, any extra. I used to joke when my kids did like the Aramark Youth Group at the uh, Dean Dome, you know, three of us work a game and in the end, We've worked a combined, you know, um, 15 to 18 hours 
for like 15 bucks. I'm like, output, input, we're working really hard to only get $15. This is, this is stupid, all right? Economically, it makes no sense. We're working harder than what we are getting out of it. So that's what Fukuzawa says. Their freedom to better themselves, to invent, to create, to work harder is what makes them so special. People who put forth the minimum effort have no chance to advance. So what we've got to understand what makes them special is their governmental and legal systems. And so the Japanese decide that they are going to write a constitution. They're going to present the constitution to their people. It's going to be a gift. And it's funny, um, at the end of the 19th century, the Japanese realized in a very short time, all of their efforts have paid off. They are the first non-Western country to build a modern nation state. They have industrialized, they have done it. And their progress actually rivals the industrialized West. They're competing with Germany and Great Britain and even the United States. And political parties begin to form. The right to hold elections was written into the Japanese Constitution as a way, as an incentive to inspire the people to work harder. And the Japanese National Assembly was created to unite the emperor and his people, to get rid of the old traditional samurai ways and to become modern. There's an old Tom Cruise movie called The Last Samurai. It's very long, but it's not bad. And it talks about this transition period where we're going to break completely with the old world past and we're going to do something new. Kind of very similar to what China did with Sun Yat-sen. And the Japanese look around for a constitution. They really want one. They're like, the French one, no, man, that thing's way too complicated. And there's like eight of them. The American one, yeah, that's awesome. But it gives the power to the people. Who's got one that'll work with the powers of the king or the emperor? Ha! I know. That guy over there in Germany. That Bismarck guy. Let's get his. And so... The Japanese Constitution was written based on Otto von Bismarck's model from Prussia. The Japanese modified it and adapted it, making it a better fit for Japan, but it gave the emperor great power. It limited the power of the Japanese legislature, which was known as something I need to go on, was known as the Japanese Diet. The emperor was in court, remember this is the only single dynasty left in all of world history. And the emperor is seen as sacred and incorruptible. All right, he, was, he was holy, or he's a living god. And when the diet was not meeting, the emperor commanded the, the, the military. And just like with Bismarck, the chancellor in now Germany, the emperor was able to appoint a prime minister. And he was able to rule by imperial decree, meaning whatever he said was going to become a law. And he presents this constitution, oh, we have a diet and we can elect people, but it's all a facade, but it's a gift to the Japanese people from the emperor. Japan had industrialized and now they were going to show the world what they can do. And this brings in their first big test. In 1894-1895, the Japanese go to war with China over interests in Asia. Japan badly wanted territory. And they forced China to sign an agreement saying that if any Japanese businesses or factories in China were threatened, the Japanese military could intervene. 
When the Chinese rebelled, Japan sent in their military troops. They were to beat up and force the Chinese peasants to get back to work. And this incident is known as the Boxer Rebellion because the guys, the Chinese protesters, all right, the White Lotus, um, their fighting style looked like they were boxers. And Japan comes in and hammers the boxers. They kill the Chinese. And Japan achieves victory. And with the signing of the business agreement and success of putting down the Boxer Rebellion, the Japanese are looking for a bigger target to showcase their power. I mean, they beat China, but it was like China. No matter of fact, the Japanese knew they had made it. When they showed up to the peace agreement, the Chinese were wearing their ceremonial traditional robes, and the Japanese show up in Western business suits and tuxedos. Well, to show off their power, the Japanese secure an alliance with Great Britain and the United States that said if Japan ever went to war with Russia, the Western powers wouldn't intercede. They would just kind of let it go. And in 1906, the Japanese declare war on Russia. They go up and they destroy the Russian fleet. And this is kind of a, a, a crappy thing. They destroy the Russian fleet and then they declare war. And the Russian Pacific Naval Fleet was also their whaling fleet. Japan knew if we sunk the, the fleet off of Siberia, it'll take a year for the main Russian fleet to go through the North Sea, through the English Channel, down the Atlantic, off the coast of Africa, around the Indian Ocean, across Vietnam, and up the Pacific. They would have to sail around the globe. So as is Japan's MO, they sink the fleet and then they declare war. Well, the war turns into a, a, a stalemate, and it is the United States President Teddy Roosevelt that will negotiate and write the peace treaty. In the end, it heavily favors Japan. And Japan felt it was finally getting the recognition that it badly wanted. But even with this, Japan was still on the receiving end of treaties that more heavily favored the West instead of them. They said, well, wait a minute. You know, why aren't you, why aren't you like listening to us? And Japan was angry that Western countries were limiting the amount of immigrants. Canada, the United States, Great Britain, were not let in Japanese um, immigrants. And they go, well, we've worked hard to get this done. Why aren't you letting us in? And we defeated Russia. And the West said, well, yeah, but it was, it's Russia, man. Nobody really likes them, right? Nobody really likes them. So Japan felt angry. And they said that, you know what? You guys became powerful by taking over the world, by reaching out and grabbing colonies. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to do the same daggone thing. And this is where the Japanese are going to create the empire of the rising sun. We will talk about that. Um, and we will talk about the revival of the samurai tomorrow, and we will begin imperialism. So thanks, guys. Hope you watched this and enjoyed it, and we'll get this writing workshop done quickly.